Our dear viewers and listeners, greetings to you in the mighty and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Today, we once again come to you with the word of God. The infallible. Indestructible. Ever living. Word of God. The life giving form of God is what we bring to you today. So we invite you to invite someone to join us and together we are going to have a wonderful time. Before we begin the session, let's begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We give you worship, for you alone are worthy of it. There is no one like you, Heavenly Father. Unto you belongs the power, the glory, the wisdom. Salvation belongs to you. This day, Heavenly Father, we come to say thank you. We come to the throne of grace and mercy, that we may obtain grace and mercy to help in times of need. Precious Holy Spirit, may you have your way. Reign in us. Reign through your word. Cause Jesus to come alive. Manifest him in the lives of men to bring healing, to open our eyes, to bring redemption, to bring growth, to bring joy, and to bring liberty. All the glory and the power and the praises is yours, King of glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's text we draw from the book of Romans, chapter 5, from verse 1 to verse 5. The Bible says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and not only that but we also glory in tribulation Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now this hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us such wonderful words of life. And in this text, we have revealed to us the benefits that come to us when we are justified through our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is exciting news because many of us come to the faith and do not understand what it is that we actually receive because of Christ's life death and resurrection. 
wa oluvanyuma ruhula muno kufa na mazuki ga Kristo Yesu but the benefits are enormous ngate miganyulo jino minene and in these five verses enyiriri zine tano we see revealed to us tufuno kubikuliwa je the five benefits emiganyulo eta that come as a result of our being justified by faith jitwa we oluvanyuma ruhugobwa ko musangu kwa fungo ko kiriza but like we said last week ngabwe twayogera week eri this is not a multiple choice question approach chino sije chibuzo nti olinamu binje byokweronderamu so this is not about cherry picking this one works this one does not techiri mukulonda nti ronda mu chino chikola chiri techikola god is not saying you can have this and have this but not this katonda tagambye nti chino chonchi kuwa chiri chikuwa ne chiri cho sija chiku what we see is an addition the use of the word and wano echigambo chebakozesa era chitegeza okwongera ko in verse 1 the bible tells us oliriyo lusoka bible that having been justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ okuita mukama afi yesu christ what that means that through our faith in jesus christ okuita mukukiriza kwetwa samu yesu christ and that speaks to his life death and resurrection tutegezo obulamu bwe okufa nokuzukira kwe every barrier buli 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 chali kituleresa hinders this relationship with god e chali kiziza okusse kimubo kolagana ne katonda has been removed bijidwa wu and this is achieved e rachi no twachifuna through three terms that we saw previously okuita bubigamo byali bisatu twabiga kedda ke the first one is propitiation e kisoka kwe kukuso busungu which we find in romans chapter 3 and verse 25 cyo soma mu barumi satu runyirirwa what the term means is that Jesus Christ yes to his life and death gaita mubulamu bwe no kufakwe appeased the wrath of god yakusobusungu bwakato in other words he met all the justice requirements of god yasasula byonna katonda byali abanja okufuna obutukira and therefore made a way for us nalyo katufutekera we in that now a just god ntikakati kato a holy god can relate with a sinful man through him and that is exciting news that is the good news of the gospel that paul is talking about the second term that we encounter is the term redemption which means to buy out of a marketplace for those of you that have had an encounter in a marketplace what happens there is buying and selling it is trading you go there with money and come away with goods now what is it being envisaged in redemption is in a slave market where you and I were slaves to sin and Christ by his life death and resurrection purchased us from the marketplace of sin but I told you there is the term that is used in Greek which is exagorazo and that means he bought you and us never to sell us back again so no matter the price he has redeemed us that means you are not up for sale Christ has bought you and having bought you he has cleansed you and the next term we see is the term reconciliation 
That means Christ then becomes the middleman. The mediator. Bringing God and man to the table. Fulfilling what Paul writes about in Timothy. When he says there is one God. And one mediator between men and God. The man Jesus Christ. He is the only one. God enough to relate with God and man enough to relate with man and be able to draw both parties through the terms of his sacrificial death on the cross be able to bring the two together because by his blood he claims is the sinner that draws to him. And he now brings that sinner to God. Saved. Cleansed. Purified. In the eyes of God. So through him we have peace with God. The second benefit we saw is that we have access to the very presence of God. So he did not just bring us into a relationship, but we who were far off have now been brought near, brought to a place where we can have fellowship with God, brought to a place where we can worship God, brought to a place where we can commune with the Father in a meaningful and deep way. Brought to that place where we can relate with God like no other being on the face of this earth. Why? Because through his death, Jesus Christ has now made a way. The way which the Bible talks about in Hebrews 10, 19. And it describes it as a new and living way. Into the holiest. Speaking of the holy of holies. The Lord, the place where the Lord dwells the place that has the mercy seat, the place where we find the throne of grace. No wonder in the book of Hebrews, he says, therefore, let's approach the throne of grace and mercy and be able to obtain mercy and grace, which will help us in our time of need. So you and I have a grand invitation because of this access that we have as a result of having been justified by faith. And the Bible talks about it as the access into this grace. Now, grace gives you what you don't deserve. Grace speaks about that which you do not merit. Jesus Christ has made a way. And in this grace, you stand. Right now, as we speak, we are the children of God. First John 1, 3, 2. He says, Beloved, now you are the children of God. Now you are part of God's family. Through Jesus Christ you have been drawn nigh. But then he says it does not appear. What you shall be. It has not yet been revealed. But when he 
talking about Jesus in his glory shall appear. We shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And so that speaks of the hope of the glory. Which we see as the third benefit. The hope that speaks of the future which yet when he speaks he speaks of it like it is already in the past why because it is a foregone conclusion this is how you shall be and that hope is the hope that then causes us to persevere in the face of tribulation. What you need to understand about this scripture or these benefits is that one is added to the other. So in verse 3 he says, and not only that, but also we glory in tribulation. How do you glory in tribulation? Because you know this will also pass. And here he gives us an understanding. He says knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. In other words, don't run. Hang in there. That tribulation for the cause of Christ is aimed at producing endurance in you. Some versions use the word patience. And in the book of James, he reminds us that count it all joy when you encounter various trials knowing this that the trial of your faith which faith is that? The faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says it produces patience. Which is the same word as perseverance. And he says let patience have its full work. So what he's referring to there is what he brings back Paul brings us back to in the book of Romans chapter 5. Why? Because patience or perseverance produces character. Some versions call it proven character. In other words, by trial, you sit this examination and pass it. And he talks about Character producing hope. And says this hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the objective is to perfect us. The objective is that so, so many of us who are incomplete at first now become perfect. Complete. Lacking nothing. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Amen. And then he says this hope does not disappoint. What he has been bringing from the beginning is trying to show us of the legal transaction that happened. The one that brings to us the peace with God, the access into this grace that gives us the hope that we have in God. Now he comes from up and brings it down to where we are. He shows us that our Christianity is not a theoretical 
understanding. It is dynamic. It is real. It is active. And what he has done, justification, then says he, because of the love of God, that has been poured out in our hearts. Therefore, we have hope. Therefore, the hope we have cannot be disappointed. This is real. This is personal. And this is eternal. I, I, I love the way he puts it. He says the love of God has been poured. In other words, this is not sprinkled. So it is not something applied topically. This is not a makeup. I want us to see what he wants us to see here. He is not talking about love for God. He's not talking about the love that we show God. He's not speaking about our love for God. He is saying the love of God. Speaking and the term, the Greek word there that is introduced for the very first time in the book of Romans is the Greek word agape, which speaks of the love of God, a love that is selfless, a love that is self-giving, the love that is sacrificial, the love that seeks to give the highest good to the one that is loved. Let me repeat it. When we talk about the agape love of God, we are speaking of that love that seeks the highest good of, to the one that is loved. So Paul tells us here that that love, the love of God, has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And that is amazing. Because in another portion of scripture, he will ask and says, what shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Through Jesus Christ, we are recipients of the love of God. This love is not trickling. This love is outpouring. This love is gushing out. I happen to travel to the northern part of Uganda. And at the Maction Falls, I began to see these falls having the waters pour down. This is a downpour. It has a roar to it. And that gushing of the water, that pouring of the water non-stop, I believe gives us the picture that we have when the Bible says that the love of God has been poured out into our heart. It is overflowing. It is a love that can be experienced within your heart. It is a love that takes you through tribulation, knowing that God has not abandoned you. It is that love that encourages you through the storms of life. It is that love that provides the support that we need when everything around us is giving way 
It is that love that provides the direction. When we don't see our way out of a situation, it is that love that says, I am here when everybody has forsaken. And it is you alone. The love of God shed abroad in your heart, poured out in your heart, is there to say it is well. It is that love that provides, that gives when no one else can give to you. That love is what Paul talks about in Romans 8, 39. And he says, and who shall separate us? from the love of God. And he says, for I am persuaded that neither death no life, no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come. And verse 39 yards, neither height, no depth, no any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is he trying to say? He's saying there is nothing absolutely nothing that can separate you from this love of God. So through whatever situation you are going through, the love of God is present. And when we talk about the love of God, we need to understand that it is not something apart from God that you have. When we talk about the love of God, it is God giving himself. It is God giving his son. It is God giving the Holy Spirit. It is God giving grace upon grace to you. The Bible tells us that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. This is the incomprehensible truth of the gospel. That God has loved sinful, fallen, rebellious man. And he has loved him so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The question I need to pose to you, if God loved us that much when we were sinners, how about now? when we have been saved and justified. If why we were sinners, he loved us. If why we were sinners, he gave his son to die on our place. How about now that we are saved? How much love does he have for us? You see, God's love came to us when we were powerless, when we were helpless to bring ourselves to God. It came to us when we were powerless to be able to overcome sin. God's love came to us when we were helpless to escape from death. God's love came to us when we were powerless from the 
to be able to extract ourselves from the grip of Satan. God's love comes to us. When we were swimming in our sin, when we were ungodly in every way possible, when we were unworthy of his love, that is when he gave his only begotten son to die for us on a cross so that his wrath can be propitiated so that we can be reconciled so that we can be redeemed. It is that rare generous love of God the very thought that a God who hates every thought of sin, who hates every deed of sin, can love a man who harbors every thought of sin and who acts every action of sin. And he loves that man enough to save him. Enough to come down on this earth, live a limited life, die on the cross, so that the sinner can become the saint. That love is what he has poured out in our heart. The love that assures us that we are safe in his hands. That we can lean on him. That we can never be let go of. He loves us not to let us go. His love brings us to his family. This love makes us his own for all eternity. Paul in the scriptures, Romans chapter 8 verse 32, then asks this question. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Will he not also with him freely give us all things. So what he's trying to say is that the best is yet to come. You haven't seen anything yet. God has given his base. What prevents him from giving you the lesser things. He has given the biggest thing. So these others are simply additions to what he has given. He has given the greatest measure. How much more these other small things? So these things, and the Bible says, all things, not a few things, not some things, but all things. So if I have come to a place in my life, understanding this love of God, to know that in Christ Jesus, I can have everything. If I don't have it, and God can't give it to me, then it means two things. I don't need it. All, it means that it is not beneficial to me and the purpose that God has for my life. And here is what is important. 
Jesus puts it in another way. In John chapter 15 and verse 7. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. This is an amazing scripture because what Jesus here is envisaging is a situation where he is the vine and we are the branches. And the branches are drawing everything they need for life from the vine. So the vine can thrive on its own. But the branch cannot thrive without the vine. It cannot be fruitful without the vine. So he says, if you abide in me and allow my words to abide in you, in other words, you don't divorce yourselves from what I've said. The result of the words abiding in you is that you will ask. The reason you will not ask is because the words are not abiding in you. Or you are not abiding in him. But you see, once we are justified, by faith and have now drawn near and have that fellowship with him. We abide in him and him in us and his words abide in us. Then the result of that we ask. He says, you will ask. Why would we be able to ask? Because asking comes from abiding. So when we abide in him, the natural consequence of our abiding is that we ask. And he says, you will ask what you desire. Why? Because at that point, once his words are in us, and they are abiding in us, what we ask is not our desire for our selfish gains. What we ask then is his desire. Why? Because his desire and our desire become one. Oh, I am reminded of Enoch. In the Old Testament, the Bible says, and he walked with God and was no more because God took him. And before he was taken, he bore this testimony. He tells us that he pleased God. And this speaks volumes to us today. Because where we stand, based on our faith, in God. And that faith comes when we believe in the person of Jesus Christ and his finished work. The Bible tells us that number one, we have peace with God. And to the peace, he adds access. To the access he had. So and to the hope he pours love out. The love in our hearts. And he says, when we abide, we ask. And when we ask, it shall be done for us. So if you will at least ask, 
he will give it. Why will he give it? Because he has already given the best. He did not spare his own son. And now he pours out his love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit then becomes the witness to you and I that we are loved by God. The Holy Spirit then becomes the assurance to us that we now, where we are, have the love of God poured in our hearts as a result of us being justified. Many times, when you see brethren together and the genuine love of God being evident among them. It is a fresh breath of life. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is moving. The love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord is being made evident. People are giving of themselves. People are loving God. People are loving one another. It is that love that is infectious. It is that love that the world is longing to see. It is that love that the sinners are seeking. So my brother, my sister out there, that is the love that describes us. That is the love Love that demonstrates that we have been justified by God. That is the love that the summit talks about and says, oh, how we good it is. Oh, how pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is that love that bonds them together. That is the calling we are called to. That is the height we need to get back to. That the love of God poured in our hearts will now be poured out. We are not here to be reservoirs. We are on this earth to be channels of God's love. We are on this earth to be agents of God's love so that where we go, God's love goes. Where we dwell, God's love dwells. When we speak, God's love flows out of our mouth. When we act, God's love is made manifest in this dark world. That is our challenge. That is the evidence of our justification. So will we take this love and reveal it to the world? Now to the one that is not born again, you cannot know this love. You can rehearse all the poems in the world. You can sing all the songs you can think about. You can have as many friends as you would want. You cannot experience this love. It is still far away from you. This love comes as a result of justification. This love comes when we accept God's love. And how do we accept God's 
Isla. When we accept Jesus in our lives, as our personal Lord and Savior, that's when God's love is poured out in our hearts. We are justified. And the love of God is poured out in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. Do you need that love? Will you receive that love? Why don't you say this with me? And God will come to you in a special way. I know you are helpless of your own. I know you are in a hopeless situation. But that is a good place to begin. Right now, we can go to God and say, Lord, I need that love to be poured out in my heart. I have been living my life one person in five. But today, here I am, Lord, longing to for this love, longing to experience it in my heart. God of heaven and earth, the loving Father, who loved this world that you gave your only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. Here I am before you. I am a sinner. I need this love. I need this savior in my life. Jesus, Yes. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. That you died for my sins. And rose again on the third day. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Pour your love in my heart. That that love may cause an overflow everywhere I am and everywhere I go to the glory and praise of your name. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you say that prayer from the bottom of your heart, you have been graciously saved. Not by works, but by faith in the person of Jesus Christ and his finished work on our account. What has happened to you? God has now credited you credited to your account his glory his righteousness what have you received right now you have peace with God right now you have access to the throne of grace right now the hope of God is with you Right now, as we speak, the love of God has been poured out into your heart by the Holy Spirit. How wonderful, how marvelous are these ways. To the believer in Jesus Christ, to the one that is born again, the love of God has been poured out in your heart. I pray in the name of Jesus that wherever you go, may that love touch the world. May that love touch your world. May that love transform your world to the glory and the praise of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you for watching us today from Dominion Church International. It's been a pleasure having you. Till we meet again, we're saying shalom. God richly bless you. I don't know if you didn't know.